Our Father in heaven, we're already greatly blessed as we're worshiping you today. We're thankful for the precious young people here for this music festival, for the way that we've been profoundly blessed by the gifts you've given to them and lifting their uh, musical talents and their, their instruments in praise to you today. We're thankful that you've called us both here to this campus and via our website and those listening to a message of hope on the radio, that you would bless each one according to your great love and according to our need. And may the practical counsel of your word today bless lives, bless families, bless this community. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few months ago, Juan Rodriguez had only 78 cents in his checking account. Have you ever had 78 cents in your checking account? It's kind of a troubling reality check. He had 78 cents in his checking account, about $50 in cash. He'd already filed for bankruptcy. He owed $2,200 in back taxes and $42,000 in credit card debt. Juan's uh, finances were not that healthy. Today, he is a mega millionaire. You say, how did he go from unhealthy finances to healthy finances? Answer. He won the jackpot in the New York State Lottery, <laughs> $149 million. You say, well, now Juan's uh, financial woes are over, right? Not necessarily. Have you noticed how many people who win the lottery are bankrupt just a few years later? You see, if you, if you have unhealthy finances, and part of unhealthy finances is playing the lottery, but... Uh, if you have unhealthy finances and you don't change, it doesn't matter how much money someone gives you, you're going to end up with unhealthy finances again. It's like rags to riches and back to rags again. People like Suzanne, who won the Virginia lottery, granted she only won four million, but four million is a lot of money, and 11 years later, all she had to show for that was $152,000 in debt. Or Paul, who won the Florida lottery, $20 million, ended up in bankruptcy court owing $5 million. That was two wives, five houses, 12 cars and motorcycles, and a failed business later. <laughs> the lesson is obvious. It doesn't matter how much money. You might, not, you might agree that playing the lottery is... a uh, certainly unwise, uh, but even if a loving relative were to bequeath you some wonderful estate, if you receive it with unhealthy finances, uh, there's a good chance that you'll end up just where you started, unhealthy finances again. So today, as we continue our study of what it means to be a healthy Christian, we want to talk about a crucial topic, healthy finances. And if you were not with us for the past two messages in this series, I want to encourage you to go to our website at forestlakechurch.org or get a CD of the messages. I think the first message was crucially important, at least it is for me, and that is looking for a healthy lifestyle. I think you'll find principles there that will help you. And what a blessing last week when our teenagers helped us to give us a reality check about our families and how we need balance there if we're going to be healthy. But today, healthy finances, and I want you to take your Bible now, and if you would like to take notes, on the back of the bulletin insert, you'll find five principles, at least you'll find five lines to write, five principles for healthy finances. We want to take those right from the Word of God. I had someone after first service who I respect greatly as a man of great uh, wisdom with finances. He said, uh, that was right on. I said, thank you. It was right out of the Bible. <laughs> so you may want to take notes. These principles could change your family. They could change your life. They could enable you to be a greater blessing to those around you as part of being a healthy Christian. So let's start with the first principle, and I'm going to share some texts. Some of them you'll have time to look at with me, and some you may just want to write down.
But I'd like you to begin by looking in your Bibles at James 1 and verse 17 as I give you the first principle for healthy finances. James 1 and verse 17. You know this text, but it is a foundational text as we begin today. James 1 and verse 17. My Bible says, Every good and perfect gift is from where? It's from above, from the Father of lights with whom there are no variation or shadow of turning. James tells us under the inspiration of the Spirit that every gift we have comes from above. So before we start talking about the nuts and bolts, if you will, of finances, let's remember there's much more than finances here. The very fact that you're breathing today, that you have life, is a gift from our Creator God. Is that right? The fact that you have an eternal hope through Jesus Christ, His Son, that's, that's a gift from above. Isn't that right? So just talking about finances without looking at the big picture uh, is, is inadequate. But part of being a healthy Christian is having healthy finances and recognizing that everything... Every blessing comes from above. With that in mind, here's the first principle, if you'd like to write it down, and then a text to write down. If every gift comes from above, every blessing, including financial blessings, first principle for healthy finances is this. Put God first in your finances. You say, Derek, where do you get that from? Write this text down, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. Here the wise man Solomon gives us a principle for healthy finances. Here's what the Word of God says. Proverbs 3 verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. If you're going to have healthy finances as a healthy Christian, a first principle is to put God what? first in your finances. Now, some folks are like, well, you know, I've got to make sure everything's covered, and if I have anything left over at the end, then I'll give something to God. No. Healthy finances says that I'm going to put God, what? I'm going to put Him first. Now, I've got a confession to make. I stopped paying tithe many years ago. You look a little shocked, Lynn. I stopped paying tithe because I realized that you don't pay tithe. <laughs> you see, there's somewhere in Malachi, it's actually chapter 3, verse 8, that talks about robbing God. Now, if, if it doesn't belong to God, you're not robbing Him. If, if you're paying it to Him, that means it belongs to you, but the text says you're robbing Him. You see, tithe doesn't belong to you. Tithe belongs to God. It's holy. So we don't pay tithe. We return tithe. It's a way of saying with a tenth of our increase, Lord, every good and perfect gift comes from you, and I'm going to put you first. I remember someone telling me who later decided he would honor God in his finances. He said, I, I stopped returning a tithe to God that belonged to him, and I had less money than I had before. <laughs> and then I returned the tithe that belonged to him. It seemed like I had more. That's, that's kind of a heavenly math, isn't it? Where you put God first in your finances. And you know, I am so excited to see what's happening at Forest Lake Church. And for those of you that are visiting, uh, just uh, be patient with me for a moment. I want to talk to the church family. But I believe that revival is happening at Forest Lake Church. And one of the signs of revival is faithfulness in our finances, putting God first. And I was looking here at a report from the first three months of 2005 for our tithe. Now, for those of you that, that don't know how it works within our church, the tithe supports the local pastors here, plus the pastors in the state of Florida, plus the worldwide ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You say, we're not a very big church here, just two to three thousand, but we're part of a worldwide movement, and we believe that that message of Jesus needs to go to the world, and then Jesus is coming back. Is that right? So we're part of something much bigger than just a little campus here. And tithe is a way of putting God first so that that work can go forward. I was reading the report. I don't know if we have any of our finance people here, but for the first three months of 2005, compared to the first three months of 2004, we had a 27% tithe increase. 
Now, I just wondered if you all had a 27% uh, um, pay increase, did you? <laughs> I didn't. So it's not just those who have been faithful continuing to be faithful. Something's happening at Forest Lake Church. Is that right? I'll tell you what's happening. God is leading many new people here who are saying, I want to honor God in my finances too. I want to put God first. And God's also reviving some folk who thought it would be better to put God last and see if there was any left, when now they're realizing they need to put God first. That's a revival. What do you say? Yeah. Hallelujah. By the way, our mission offerings were up 5%. We're making our budget, which is another blessing, and that's the free will offerings. The Bible talks about returning tithes and offerings. It doesn't tell you how much to give in your offering. It just says that God loves a cheerful giver. You can write the text down in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Did you know the word miser and miserable come from the same root word? God loves what kind of giver? And cheerful givers put God what? They put him first. Joyfully saying, Lord, everything I have belongs to you, but I want to put you first. That's a key principle for healthy finances. But we're going on to principle number two now. Principle number two, having honored God with our first fruits. And this one is really profound. If you want healthy finances, number two, spend less than you earn. Duh. <laughs> spend less than you earn. But you know what? Our culture doesn't even understand that sentence. Spend less than you earn. Now, in order to spend less than you earn, you have to earn something, right? Is that right? That's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if you want to write the text down, he says, if a person doesn't work, he can't eat. <laughs> Don't just sit around and expect everybody else to feed you. If you're going to have healthy finances and spend less than you earn, you need to earn something. I was at a home improvement store just uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, and a very friendly checkout person, a gentleman, smile on his face. He said, did you find everything you need? I said, yes, thank you. He's ringing up my purchases, and as he's putting them in the bag and I'm putting the bag into my shopping cart, I noticed that he only has one arm. The other, oh, I had two arms, but one was just kind of dangling, kind of fu not functional by his side. But he was smiling and he was cheerful. He was one of the nicest checkout people I'd ever met. He gave me a, a, a receipt for my purchases and he said, you can fill out an online survey. So I did. I went online and I told them what a great checkout person I had. It also made me eligible for a $5,000 gift card. Um, <laughs> but... But I told him when I filled it out, I said, what a great person. You know, he could have been sitting around going, oh, well, life's hard and I can't get it. Have you noticed a lot of people, now I'm sorry if I offend anybody, I'm sorry, because I know there are extenuating circumstances and sometimes you're in a job transition and you have to wait patiently for God to give you exactly what he wants you to do. So, so don't be offended. I'm talking about the folks who, ha who, who, who wait there at the, uh, when you pull off the ramp, you know, out of work and want your money. And yet I drive right by and then there's the signs, helpers needed, work needed, hiring. Can't figure it out. But if you're going to follow this second principle of spending less than you earn, you have to earn something. But once you've earned it, you've got to spend less than you earn, which means, here's the B word, which means you need to have a, you need to have a budget. Now, some of you say, Derek, I don't believe in a budget. Well, all of you have a budget if you have healthy finances. It means you know you can't spend $4,000 a month eating out if you only make $3,000 a month. Even if you've just got general categories, because the goal is that you don't end up with month left at the end of the money. Some of you get that? You're supposed to end up with money left at the end of the month, but some folks, if they spend more than they earn, they end up with month left at the end of the money. So if you find yourself in that dilemma, you need a budget. And we'll talk about that in principle five. There's some things that will help you. This is not rocket science, folks. You just can't spend more than you earn and have healthy finances. We're not just talking about wanting to be wealthy. We're talking about honoring God as healthy Christians. Are you with me so far? First two principles. Put God, what? First in your finances. And secondly, spend less than you earn. 
Which brings me to principle number three. This also is a biblical principle that I want to share with you. A biblical principle. Save, thirdly, save a portion of your increase. Look at the wise man again, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. Save a portion of your increase. This is what it says. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, listen now, verse 8 of Proverbs 6, provides her supplies in the summer. That's easy. There's plenty to eat in the summer. But notice the second half of verse 8 of Proverbs 6, and gathers her food in the harvest. I want you to notice a principle that even ants understand, and that is, and by the way, I hope you can understand this even if though you live in Florida, that after the harvest comes which season of the year? See, you don't know. You've got to come from the north. There's a, there is a season up north called winter. Okay? Some of you know about winter. Winter comes after the harvest. And the ant knows, follow me now, that unless you save a portion of your increase, when you come to the winter season, when you come to the difficult time, you will have no resources available. Are you following? So saving a portion of your increase enables you to have healthy finances even when you enter into the winter time when times are difficult. When I was a young man, someone gave me three cassette tapes and they were entitled The Richest Man in Babylon. Have any of you ever listened to those tapes or read the little book by George Claussen, I think the name is? How many of you? Okay, talk to them afterwards. They're the su successful folk, all right? There are principles in that simple story that were a huge blessing to me. It's just a story, but you could play it for your children, and they would learn powerful principles of sound financial management. One of the things the character in this story learned was if you spend everything that you earned, where are you when you're done? You're right back where you started, right? So if you have a job and you have to spend less than you earn to have healthy finances, but if you spend it all, you're right back. So you ought to say, and then let that be working for you while you continue to work. Well, that's a wonderful insight, which I think perhaps some of our grandparents understood better than folks in our culture today. <laughs> that you put your increase to work in savings. Now, in the story of the richest man in Babylon, uh, the fellow had a lesson to learn because you have to save it in a safe and a wise place. We'll talk about that in principle number five. But he gave it to a man going to Tyre and asked him to buy some precious stones. He thought that would be a good investment. The only problem was the man who went to Tyre didn't know anything about precious stones. <laughs> good investment? Wrong. The man came back with worthless rocks, and he was back where he started. <laughs> That's a problem. But here, if we will put away a portion of our increase, save a portion of it, and we want to do it wisely, and we'll talk about that in principle five, we won't always end back where we started, but we will be in a more secure situation. All right? Principle number four. Principle number four for healthy finances. What do we have so far? So far? Put God first in your finances. Spend less than you earn. Save a portion of your increase. Oh, I feel passionately about number four. If I get a little overheated, pray for me, okay? But I feel really passionate about this. Number four, strive to eliminate debt. I, I get so upset. Do you get these things sent to you in the mail? I got five applications for credit cards in the last two days. Five in the last two days. Uh, am I just on some kind of strange mailing list? Do any of you get these two? Yes? Oh, yes, you said. Well, here's what makes me upset, folks. I open one of these up, and these are sent to our high school students, to our college students. Someone wants to put a noose around their neck. Now, listen. I realize you might be able to use this wisely, but that's not how it's designed. It is designed to ensnare. Listen. Zero percent intro on purchases and balance transfers. Now, I talked to someone after second service. If you use that wisely, that's a pretty good free loan. But you don't understand what they want to do to you, okay? 
So if you don't use it wisely, you're in trouble. It says zero uh, percent. Uh, you read the fine print. It says through December. But then I turned over because I like to read the fine print. And here's what the fine print says. This is if you happen to get behind, which is actually what they're hoping. Forgive me, but I know that's true. Default rate, 16.49%, 21.49%, or 25.49%, depending on your account history. If you're going to have healthy finances, strive to eliminate debt. Oh, by the way, they'll send you some checks, too. You can get cash advances. Have you ever got any of those? I mean, you know, and you go, whoa, I must have money. I've got checks. <laughs> cash advances. Oh, you know when the interest due on a cash advance, right? 30 days? Wrong. When's the interest payable on a cash advance? Right away, right away. And you want to know what it is here? Right behind the 0%? Cash advances. 22.99% interest. 22.9. I want to tell you something. You know what I'm going to do with this after church, don't you? I'm going to file it. If you're going to have healthy finances and you're going to teach uh, those around you, specifically if you have children, by the way, if you're going to give them a great start in life, a, another principle, number four, we just wrote it down, is to strive to eliminate debt. You can do that in three ways. First of all, you can decide no more debt from now on. You say, but we need new furniture. Well, live with the old. You say, I don't have any furniture. Well, have someone give some to you. We'll help you with that, but don't go into more debt. That's a first principle. Number two, be intentional about paying down your debt. Now, I talked to a counselor here. He said, if you've got seven debts and five a little, pay off the five so you don't get depressed and then you only know you have two debts. That's good psychology. But, but there's another principle too, and that is that you always pay off the most expensive debt first. So if you have a school loan at 4% and you have a credit card at 22%, guess which one you want to pay down quickly? You don't have to be brilliant. You just have to have a plan. And the ultimate goal, step three, is to set a date that you want to be debt free. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, how you get a pay increase and you think about what else you can buy. You haven't even got your tax refund and the furniture store is telling you how to buy it, something, right? But, you know, if you'd say to yourself, even if it's by the time I retire, I want to be debt free, I want my house paid off. We have some young friends, they're now in their mid-30s, successful professional. They could be living in a mansion and driving very expensive cars, but they said, by our mid-30s, we want to be debt-free. They live in a modest home, they drive modest cars, they take modest vacations, and in their mid-30s, they're debt-free. You know why that's so important? Write it down, Proverbs 22, verse 7. You know why? Because it says the borrower, Proverbs 22, verse 7, the borrower is servant to the lender. And if you don't want to be in bondage, it's a wonderful goal to set for yourself, and you can start even this week to say, by the grace of God, I'm going to have healthy finances. I have a goal to be debt-free so I don't have to be a servant to the lender. Have you noticed the credit card companies and the banks have very nice buildings? Huh? You know, they're not like in little mobile homes, are they? Because they're taking all of the money. Now, some of you say, Derek, now, be realistic, you know, taking out a mortgage, that's, that's not, that's a debt, but it's very, it's not a consumer purchase, it's an investment, and I'd have to agree there are times, and even a student loan, if it's done wisely, if you follow principle five, which I'm coming to in just a moment, that may be sound practice, but may I remind you, remind you that the word mortgage and the word mortuary come from the same root word. <laughs> it's the word death, okay? So, just because you're saying, well, I'm getting a mortgage, if you haven't followed step five, you could still be digging a hole for yourself, as some of us have learned the hard way. So the goal, principle number four, eliminate, strive to eliminate debt. And what freedom will come when we come to that place? Which brings me to principle number five. And this one is really... Next to principle one, the most important, we've decided we're going to put God first in our finances. 
We'll spend less than we earn. We'll save a portion of our increase. We will strive to eliminate debt. These are biblical principles. And then comes to principle number five. This one is so important. I want you to write it down. I want you to remember it. I'm going to give you a Bible principle here. Principle number five. Seek wise counsel from godly mentors. If you will remember that, and by the way, unbelievers know that is true. They just don't realize that we must put God first because God wants to bless us in super abundant ways. But he wants to know that he can trust us, that it's not going to destroy us. He wants to know we've got a healthy attitude towards our finances so that he can bless us in super abundant ways. And one of the ways he does that is when we seek, number five, when we seek wise counsel from godly mentors here's the text proverbs 19 verse 20 it's been going through my mind all week proverbs 19 and verse 20 here's what the word of god says listen to counsel receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days proverbs 19 verse 20 listen to counsel receive instruction when when uh, my wife and i some years ago we were wanting to make a business decision and we didn't know much about this area of investment so we found a christian that we highly respected he was very generous with god's work and successful in the things he did and experienced in this area of decision making and we asked his counsel about a particular decision and he looked over the situation and he said to us uh, if you don't buy it i will well that's good counsel by the way, I'd done the same with a mechanic who's a good Christian friend of mine, and I showed him a car. I had to pay him $20 to look at it. You know what he told me? He said, don't buy it even if they give it to you. <laughs> so seeking wise counsel from godly mentors can be a profound blessing to us. If we'll listen to counsel and receive instruction that we may be wise in our latter days. But I want us to say, Derek, what's this all about now? Just reframe it for me. Simply this. God wants to bless us in super abundant ways. He doesn't want us to just win the lottery and then be back in bankruptcy court a few years later. By the way, the, one of the worst ways to invest is the lottery. You know that, don't you? If you know anything about odds. It's a terrible way to invest. We want to learn healthy financial principles. We want to know that God can bless us in super abundant ways, just as he says in Malachi 3. We put him first. It's not just finances, but it's that too. Why? So that as we listen to wise counsel, we make wise decisions, we're able to give more away. We're able to bless more people. We're able to live more stress-free lives. Doesn't that sound wonderful? We're able to experience the healthy balance, lifestyle, finances, relationships, healthy bodies, healthy minds that will honor God. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. That's not just spoken words. That's what's happening in your life. And yes, even what's happening in your finances. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we would pray that our lives would bring glory to your name. We would pray that through an understanding of sound biblical principles, that you would be able to pour out super abundant blessings upon us. Not that we might be misers and miserable, but that we might be cheerful givers who put you first and bless those around us and listen to wise counsel. Lord, thank you for your incredible blessings. Thank you most of all for the gift of life and the gift of salvation through Jesus our Lord. And all of those blessings that come from above, may we use them in a way that would honor you and bless those around us. And we will give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.